Hi, I'm Sean Henry, the president of CrowdStrike Services and the chief security officer of CrowdStrike. And with me today, I've got two uh, long-term friends and, and colleagues from the cybersecurity industry, uh, CJ Moses, who is the current deputy CISO at AWS. And prior to being at AWS, CJ spent over 17 years uh, in both the FBI and as a special agent with the Air Force uh, Office of Special Investigations. Um, and Mary Galligan, who is currently the managing director at Deloitte, where she's been for seven years. Uh, prior to that, Mary retired after 25 years with the FBI. Her last position was as special agent in charge of the cyber and special operations branch of the FBI New York field office. Um, really great to, to be here and with these two uh, colleagues and, and friends as three former federal agents who are now leading organizations in cybersecurity in the private sector. The session really is about how we've taken our experiences and transitioned them over to the private sector from doing counterintelligence and criminal investigations and counterterrorism investigations, and certainly cybersecurity investigations. And the skill set and the, the expertise and applying them here to look at these total security practices and how do we really protect the 360 degree attack surface that we've seen uh, develop in cybersecurity. I know when we started working, the three of us in the, um, in the government, we really were focused in cybersecurity on uh, website defacements and denial of service attacks. That was really the flavor of the day 20 some odd years ago. And then moving into theft of intellectual property and financial frauds. And now to today where we see these disruptive attacks like ransomware and the destructive attacks like NotPetya uh, up into and including the attacks on critical infrastructure like adversaries using cybersecurity or cyber breaches to access critical control systems and hitting water supply companies to change the chemical composition of the water. So um, really some, some dynamic changes. I, I know, Mary, when we've talked in, in the past about what we did in the government and that mission first, and it was always about protecting good from evil, evil and how do we protect against the bad guys? And then we move over to the private sector. And from, for me, it was a bit of a different in terms of culture. I'm wondering kind of your thoughts about moving over to Deloitte based on what you've done in the government and then how you how you balance that and kind of inspire and, and uh, invoke that same sense in the private sector. Well, Sean, I think when you talk about culture, there was the culture for me of Deloitte, a very large um, accounting and consulting company, and then the culture of our clients, the ones that we were going out or we still go out to and talk and deal with cyber risk for them. I think across the board, the biggest cultural difference between the private sector and the government that I saw was um, the use of intelligence, the understanding of who the adversary is, um, what is that national security threat, and what could I have that any nation state would want? So we're seeing a big difference in people trying to understand now that attribution or that threat to our economy. But when I first came to Deloitte and working with our clients, I think that was the biggest difference. Intelligence for you, me, and CJ was just part of our conversation. Um, sharing information across agencies, part of what we did every day. And so now in the private sector, um, you see that conversation ongoing, how to share that information, how to work with the government, um, and how to use intelligence and make it actionable. So I think that's the biggest change, Sean. Well, CJ, just carry on, on that. Uh, when you and I were working back in the early 2000s, there was a lot of effort against some nation states. Nobody in the private sector was talking nation state. We were seeing nation states targeting the defense industrial base and government organizations. Um, so, so two points, I think. One, the Mary's point about intelligence, how do we use that and then take that in, when you move over to AWS, those same types of, of uh, processes, but also the same thing about culture and how do people feel about it based on, you know, you have such an important mission, protect critical infrastructure from foreign governments at AWS. How does that translate? Well, 
So it translates quite well. I think the difference is, is that from a, you know, from the government perspective versus a private sector, um, a lot of times in the private sector, um, I think for a good bit of time, uh, companies didn't, um, didn't accept that, uh, you know, that nation states or others were actually out to get them, um, where in the government, there was never any doubt that that were, was the case. So once you have, um, you know, verified threats uh, via threat intel or actual attacks, like we've seen, you know, uh, quite, a, quite a bit in the last, uh, you know, six months or so, um, companies, uh, security cultures are deriving off that. Uh, the idea that, you know, in the case of AWS, we've been very lucky to have security culture for, for a number of years. I've been there 13 years and it was there when I got there. Um, but the idea of, you know, putting security is uh, the highest priority in our case um, and using the intelligence that's, that's gathered, using the things that, um, you know, that we learn along the way to make sure that our businesses and the business owners are, are aware of those threats because, Quite honestly, that ownership of the business um, drives those owners, the, those uh, business leaders, to actually secure um, their 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 space rather than it having having it to be a security uh, specific function. It's actually part of the core business, and that's the uh, that's what you want in a security culture. Is you want strong ownership um, from the business owners, and those business owners will vector based upon uh, dynamic information that's presented to them. So just as Mary was saying, taking that to what we would call threat intelligence, turning it into re real actionable types of things that can be done, making sure things are patched um, along those lines um, are the, the types of things that, um, you know, in the private sector, using that threat intel or what we used to just call intelligence in the government and turning it into actionable things that uh, the business owners can, can go ahead and vector and make sure that uh, we maintain uh, privacy of the information that we have. Yeah, you, you do have um, a really interesting model, I, I think. I, I know what the philosophy is behind security. I think in our company, it's security first, always kind of top of mind. Um, but when I think about dealing with the private sector, a lot of the companies I've, I've dealt with, unless they understand and appreciate the real risk, um, I don't know that they always understand the need to focus on security. And when I think about folks that are kind of mid-level that are fighting the fight every day, they certainly get it because they're, they're dealing with it day in and day out. How do you, Mary, communicate that too when you're in those customer environments? How do you communicate that same sense of passion and mission and to, to those executives there? Sean, when I deal with C-suites or boards, I do a lot of board education. You're absolutely right. The key thing we need to talk about is risk. Risk to that organization at this point in time. Um, and then hopefully even be able to talk about risk to the organization in the future. But when we talk to them about risk, the key thing I think for that conversation is what is the business impact going to be of that risk, right? So they have a Everyone has an incredible business sense. Um, and I agree with you. It's not just the culture from the top down. It's also from the newest person up, right? The security starts at the keyboard. So talking about the business impact um, and showing people that no matter what we do to be secure, these incidents keep happening. Um, technology issues are gonna continue. So how do we build that resilience and how do we build that response? The business impact conversation gets everybody's attention. If I can't produce my product, if I can't um, service my customers like I'm supposed to, if I can't create new services or products, then I'm gonna be outdone by the competition. So the business impact conversation, John, becomes um, the key to these kinds of conversations. Yeah, I'm glad to hear that. I I, um, I, I am certainly seeing a change. It's, it's unfortunately it's slow, and sometimes people respond only when they see the headlines of somebody else who suffers, and that's not related just to cybersecurity. Mary, you you actually kind of broke the glass ceiling for the FBI when, when you were appointed as the the first um, female special agent in charge in the New York office, and having grown up, born and raised in New York. Um, it's a it's a tough business world there, and certainly tough from a law enforcement perspective. What were the the challenges and the opportunities you faced both in, in the FBI in that position, and then 
kind of transit transiting over to the private sector? Well, Sean, I would say um, the biggest challenge I had in that new position in the FBI ended up becoming my best opportunity. So, you know, you're put in charge of special operations from a technical perspective with people that have had expertise and experience for 20 years. Then I have the cyber guys who knew more about cyber than I would ever learn in my lifetime. And then add into that, you know, the SWAT and the crisis management expertise. So I had very, very talented, smart people who knew more about different areas of technology than I did. So that was a challenge. And making it then the opportunity was, I decided I was going to learn more and let those people who knew the most lead those parts of the investigations. Um, and I think when you look at the corporate world and now in the private sector, um, I certainly hope I do the same thing at Deloitte, but I talk to our clients about that. If you are the head of a business, um, a manufacturing business, you have to trust and collaborate and work with those people who are experts around the technology, whether the development of it, the utilization of it, and most importantly, as we're talking about today, protecting that technology. Um, and making those folks not be the doctor no, as we like to say, but the enabler. So I think, Sean, it's a challenge for business executives, as it was for me, not coming from that technical background. And it can become a very powerful opportunity if we let it. Yeah, the, the kind of the, the people are looking for business acumen. And I think some of the expertise for you, especially um, the crisis management piece, which I actually want to talk about in, in a couple of minutes, but that sure. there's so much value that's added there um, that people I don't know have a full appreciation and understanding for. Um, CJ, I, I, again, going back to kind of our time in, in the bureau together and after you came out of OSI, um, having done some of the, 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 the major investigations you'd done there, um, for us, it was always attribution was so important to know who the adversaries were so that we could take actions, whether they be financial sanctions or some type of diplomatic actions or some type of of uh, either law enforcement or intel community actions against adversaries. Then coming to the private sector, there's I remember when I came over nine, nine plus years ago, people were scoffing at attribution. It's not necessary, not important. You can't do it. Um, I'm interested in, in your thoughts there, and I, I've got some, some strong feelings about it, but I'm interested in your thoughts about that transition for you. It definitely was a transition. Uh, the, the idea that, um, you know, attribution um, was key, uh, you know, especially in the government, especially when you're investigating and going towards attribution, that was really kind of the goal of, of investigations in the government. Uh, but going to the private sector, um, you know, specifically in, you know, incident response type functions and things like that, um, there was always that discussion that, uh, you know, do we really care who's who, who's doing this? Um, we just want it to stop. And I think that's a, a false choice. I don't think you can. I think the reality is, is that we all have to remember that there is a human behind the keyboard on the other side. Um, because when you forget that, you start uh, reacting in ways that um, are, don't make a lot of sense uh, from the standpoint of an example being is that if, uh, if you think that it's just a, a computer that's attacking your computers, um, you'll try just to block them out. But the reality is, is that just by trying to block out that one attack, um, you know, as the cat and mouse game always has happened in the past, if you block out a, a human from getting in one way, you're going to have that, that same human uh, figure out another way to, to get in or to try to get in. So it's going to continue for, for a very long period of time. And I think, um, you know, remembering there's a human on the other side and trying to gain as much information as you can about your adversary in that case allows you to better protect, defend, as, as well as potentially mitigate that threat. So um, that's one of the things that it's taken a good bit of time in the private sector to, to make sure that leadership is aware of that and is willing to do the things necessary. Um, I know in the government, one of the things we always struggled with is that we would have an intrusion um, and the people that own those systems that we were working the investigation on, first thing they want to do is lock them down and uh, clean them up and move on to the next part of the business. But sometimes in order to gain that intelligence, you have to be able to be willing to have those systems online in a mitigated fashion as much as you can, but still allow that attacker to have some access in order to learn. 
and gaining that intelligence and understanding your adversary um, is the same in this virtual world as it always has been in the kinetic world. And the more information that we can gather, the better that you'll be able to defend yourself against them in the future and potentially mitigate them as a threat altogether. Yeah, I, I think that that's such an important part. I think knowing who the adversary is, knowing who the enemy is, it allows you to understand their motivations, their capabilities, their tool sets. Um, I've used an example in the past that, you know, if I walk into the CEO's office and said, hey, boss, our, we just had a you know, dozen computers that were hit with virus X, Y, Z. And, you know, the, the boss kind of looks like, OK, what does that mean versus, hey, we know that uh, this Russian organized crime group deployed this specific uh, piece of malware. We know that it's linked to, to ransomware. It's impacted 12 other companies in the last four months. This is what was you know, what the impact was by providing that much fuller explanation. I think you're in a position to better defend and be proactive and to make a lot of strong business decisions. Um, uh, all that with the caveat that attribution is rarely 100%. It can be. I, if you actually physically see somebody watching them do it, uh, and that has happened in, in certainly in the government space, but it, it's not always 100%, but it certainly puts you on a, a, a stronger footing. And the, from my perspective, the more intelligence, the better, the better prepared, the better uh, capable we are to be resilient. Um, and it's just it's just an area that I think companies need to be be thinking about so that they can be work smarter and more strategically. What do you what do you think, Mary? And Sean, absolutely. I mean, I think we've seen examples of it when we had nation states um, DDoSing our banks a number of years ago, knowing who the adversary was and how they were executing those um, attacks, you saw that information sharing in the industry, bank to bank, financial institution to financial institution, which really made a big difference because it went for over nine months. And then recently seeing um, the supply, the software supply chain attack that we had and seeing um, the company sharing the information of how did the adversary get into this software? How did they change the software? Those are very, very important things for the next company to protect themselves, to know, to have that intelligence and to know what the adversary is after. Um, we can't protect everything, so it helps us to then prioritize that. So information sharing, and, and I think that anyone who is listening to our conversation today, especially in industry, needs to continue and it needs to grow. Um, there cannot be any competition when it comes to security, and the, we need the private sector to share amongst themselves as much as possible. Of course, the caveat there is um, being able to do that without being then um, doubly victimized by either lawsuits or fines from regulators or, um, but that's probably a topic for another session. Yeah, I mean, look, it's a complex issue for sure, yeah. especially when the government is looking for intel from the private sector. Having yeah. been on, the, on both sides of this, I understand the complexities. Uh, I think that there's a lot of successful one-offs and certainly the ISACs and the ISAOs are, are helpful in that regard. They're able to anonymize uh, data, et cetera. Uh, so there's there's so many opportunities. I think it behooves us to overcome the complexities and, and the adversity there. Uh, the, the, the piece you're talking about, I know, re re relates to Iran. And I talked to people where they were attacking the financial services sector. And um, that went on for many months. And um, it happened based on financial sanctions that the U.S. government implemented against Iran. And I tell people, here's a, a great example of, of intel. It's happened two or three times where the U.S. has levied sanctions and then Iran has, uh, has embarked on DDoS attacks uh, targeting specifically yeah. the financial services sector. Well, guess what? If you're in the financial services sector and the U.S. is about to levy sanctions on Iran, you might want to work with your providers to a better ba load balance your, your environment, recognizing that this might happen, right? Because we've seen it happen two or three times, it's likely gonna happen again. That, another great example of the use of intelligence to allow us to be more proactive, understanding geopolitical issues and how they impact the adversary's use of the network as a weapon, as well as a tool. Uh, and that actually takes me to a, another point, CJ, um, because 
when I see over the last few years, this much more aggressive um, movement by adversaries and the movement into more disruptive or destructive attacks, uh, the movement towards kind of the physical world versus what we saw, website defacements, denial of service or PII theft. Um, you and I had a really interesting conversation uh, probably about a year ago, and you were talking about this concept of total security and the 360 degree attack surface. And I, I really found it fascinating. I certainly had thought about it, but not in the way you you put it together and kind of I was able to visualize it much better after talking to you. What what are the challenges for organizations in looking at the physical, the operational, the digital, the personnel, um, the supply chain? I think we should talk about as well in, in greater detail. But give me some of your thoughts on that. And yeah. Share it with these folks here because I really think it's it's uh, appropriate. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the context that we were talking about is you know what is the role of the CISO in in the totality of security of, of your business. And, you know, I think that, um, you know, some people may think, you know, uh, CISO, the chief information security officer in information almost relating to IT. And in many times the, the CISOs report into CIO, other things in businesses. So they, they uh, unnecessarily think the scope of their responsibility is very narrow and only the IT or in many cases re related or referred to as the cyber space. Um, the reality is, is that um, in order to protect the information, you must be responsible or at least the, the steward for ensuring the uh, security um, across the board, everything from the physical security of the data centers um, that you know you, your data resides in, um, all the way through to the personnel security. Um, these days, there's growing and growing um, uh, possibilities for insider threat. So uh, personnel security comes into play very heavily there. So the idea that as you know, if you're the chief information security officer, that potentially you don't own physical security does not abdicate your responsibility um, for the security functions that fall in somebody else's potentially in, in somebody else's responsibility or title area. The reality is that the, the, that role and the team uh, through that, um, you can't abdicate ownership of all the other facets of security just because you may think that your, your title or your written responsibilities are within one space. Because the reality is, is that the threats to information come from the complete cycle. Uh, completely, everything from physical, cyber, um, personnel. So uh, you have to keep that in mind when um, putting together a security program um, and ensuring that as you're um, as as you're putting that program together, that even if it's not within your job title, that you are the advocate for doing so. Uh, one of the things here at AWS that uh, we're lucky to have is we do have a very uh, forward security culture that um, you know, we, we establish tenants around those types of things. So security, durability, availability in that order. This is a very easy thing for our, our staff to understand. We also believe in strong ownership, meaning that um, if you own a business, you own it cradle to grave, including security of that business. So the profit and loss, success, failure, security of your, your business is your responsibility. So therefore the combination of a strong ownership model that includes having a security culture, um, as well as a CISO or uh, you know, or chief security officer, whatever title it may be, that is a strong advocate for all forms of security within the business, um, as enablers to the business, not as the land of no, um, is a key and important uh, you know uh, role uh, within the business, and it's key that uh, that mindset of ownership is is uh, throughout the business as well. Yeah, I, I think that, that that's so critically important. And, and I, I think coming from the government that we think about that more often than folks who've grown up in solely IT, they're not thinking about that, that totality. But I think about cases that I've seen just in the last couple of years, foreign intelligence services looking to get people hired into companies. Um, foreign intelligence services co-opting people who are in companies where people being extorted, innocent, uh, employees who were extorted. We saw, um, you know, a, a, a uh, organized somebody who may have been associated with organized crime, according to to media reports, uh, unclear, uh, but looking to uh, pay somebody at a major 
uh, company to put introduce malware into their system, into their network, and where they were offered a million dollars to do it, right? So uh, these things happen. And I think unless people are thinking about that uh, broadly, they're, they're, uh, they're really doing a disservice to the company. We're missing opportunities to better protect the organization. Uh, Mary, I kind of pull on that because you're dealing with so many C-suites. Um, I, I find it's incumbent upon me when I talk to, to boards and executives to really introduce this because I want them thinking critically. I want them thinking more holistically. Are you finding the same with, with your experience? Yes, finding the same. And, you know, Sean, you and I and CJ are very familiar with the phrase inside of threat um, and explaining it to executives um, in a way that then they can do something and incorporate some processes in their organization. So for example, um, everybody talks about training when it comes to cyber and the conversation usually ends with, you know, phishing training. Um, and you can take that conversation and say, that's not the end of the training, right? You have three kinds of employees when it comes to insider threat. You have those that are ignorant. They don't know our policies to CJ's point. They don't know the culture yet, they're new. And so we have to train them differently then the second group, which are indifferent to the policies, right? They've been around long enough. You're smiling because we both know that that group is um, those senior 13 agents, right? And so they've been around long enough. And to their credit, they found ways to do things quicker. They found ways to, um, on a Friday at five o'clock, wrap up this part of the business. However, those bring their own risk. And then the third group is that malicious group, right? That malicious insider who either um, willingly or unwillingly takes information from the organization. And you also have, Sean, um, the more we collaborate in the business world, the more we have our employees believe that they own this part of the business, whether it's, I created an algorithm, I created an app, I created this research paper, and so when I'm leaving company X to go to company Y, it's okay that I download all this information and take it with me. Um, no, that's data leaving, leaving the, the organization. Or I'm frustrated or angry at something at the organization, so I do something to the operational technology and I disrupt some type of um, processes or manufacturing. So when you talk to business, business executives about it that way, that the training to CJ's point of our employees has to be much wider. That means someone in human resources needs to understand the threat, the, the cyber threat to um, the organization as well as the system. Um, hiring needs to understand that. The head of the business needs to understand that. Um, so I think we're gonna continue to see that training and hopefully become a lot more robust than around you know, just fishing. Um, training. No, no doubt. I, I mean, two important points that you, you made there, I think. One is th this is a holistic response. And I've seen companies now starting these insider threat teams, which are made up of not only the CISO, but the chief security officer and HR and legal and someone from the COO shop, where you're really looking across the company. And I think it's important. We're not trying to develop a culture where Big brothers watching, or you know, the, the company's watching every step you make, but really getting people to think differently and recognize it's such a small percentage of people that are going to do it. But the culture is very clear. If you're leaving to go somewhere else, that's okay. Everyone has an opportunity to succeed somewhere else, but you can't take this stuff with you. And that's cultural. And then there might be sanctions or repercussions there. Um, so CJ, kind of going back to your 360 piece, one of the other areas in addition to insider that we've been talking about, I, I mentioned um, the supply chain. And I know going back to the early mid 2000s in the government, the, the, uh, the Department of the Defense was working on how to secure the supply chain. And, you know, we're, we're seeing now the inability for companies to get chips to do their manufacturing because they're not manufactured domestically. They're only manufactured uh, internationally. Um, what, what are your thoughts? We've seen some recent uh, big issues in the last uh, in the last six months or so, uh, although I've seen them going back many years, but not not always publicized. What are your thoughts on that and how we, we in the in the cybersecurity business can have a better impact on that in our companies? 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think going back to, you know, the, the early 2000s and stuff like that, there was a lot of focus on supply chain. A good bit of it was still focused towards your hardware supply chain. Um, it might have been in the cyberspace. So computers, the actual, you know, firmware chips or otherwise that are within those computers. Um, but the, the reality is that all of those devices uh, run software on top of them. And that if you can um, get into the software supply chain, um, many times giving our new DevOps model or more continuous uh, integration and development model, um, you can actually uh, have um, threats that are self-upgradable uh, via the software just as we increase um, the, the threats or just as we increase um, the, the, the threats are able to increase just as our defenses. So that's one of the things that um, you know we have to stay on top of um, from a software supply chain. Um, the, the the threat is is quite large from the standpoint that a lot of companies are using third party software, software that's that's outside of, of their own remit of creating it. At Amazon, we create a lot of our own software, but just like a lot of other companies, we use some pieces, parts of different capabilities from different companies or interconnect them. And we have to do a large amount of security review um, on where the, the source of that, that software, uh, where it comes from and how it's uh, gonna be implemented. The, the important thing here is, and things that uh, others can do in that space is uh, making sure that, you know, you talked about the Department of Defense and a lot of the work that they did, they, they were big on talking about uh, defense in depth and having um, different, uh, different means by which to detect things. Um, and I think that's one of the things that uh, we find that is very useful today, although using different terminology, and that is, is that not only looking at the software that you're using, making sure that you're aware of its origin as well as what it's going to do or what it's intended to do, um, doing testing of that in various different formats, everything from structured testing to fuzzing um, and taking, taking all of that and still um, applying you know, mechanisms that are belts and suspenders. What do I mean by that? Um, being able to um, have monitoring devices, and I don't mean monitoring the people, monitoring the, the software itself, um, looking for aberrations and how it's communicating. If software is designed to do uh, communication between X, you know, X and Y, and then on every 10th day, you see some sporadic communication to Z, that's probably something you want to look at. And that's what you can have systems created um, in order by which to look for aberrations in, in, within that environment. We use CrowdStrike Falcon for some of that on, on our edge devices um, in order to look for those aberrations um, because really the totality of the software supply chain, you have to start from the beginning and work your way through it. And at the same time, be, uh, be very vigilant to the communications and the access that that software has. Because very much just like we were just talking about people and the insider threat, the more that you can limit the access to data, whether to humans or to other systems, uh, the better better off you will be. So a lot of future um, investment you'll see going towards contingent authorization or just in time uh, off, meaning that people and systems will have access based upon a set of parameters that are met for a very specific and short period of time. And then that access will go away that allows you to be able to be more fine grained in um, in the you know risk surface that you have within your space, and also helps to provide some of those belts and suspenders to protect us against software supply uh, chain issues. Yeah, really, it's such an important piece, and it's not going away anytime soon. We're all interconnected. Um, uh, let me kind of wrap up here, and I, I think I always find value in hearing good stories uh, th that highlight some of the important points that we've made, and I'll ask. Start with you, Mary, just kind of uh, going back to your time in the government, in the bureau, um, maybe kind of a war story, something that you, you've gone through that you were able to take lessons learned and apply them in your current position in the private sector. Well, Sean, one of the um, biggest war, well, war stories I have about one of the biggest breaches was um, to a financial institution where right out of the gate, it was extremely important to know who the adversary was because we were trying to determine what they wanted. Um, and you still see that question in today, you know, seven, eight years later, um, about who is it, what do they want? 
The second part of that breach, which was extremely, at the time, um, an opportunity for me to learn, was they had to bring the business and the technology folks literally together and sit at the table to say, okay, how do you use this technology? What was this technology meant to do? And then um, they could have a better idea of the forensics around the cyber attack. And the third piece was working with the government, you know, us and the FBI, DHS, NSA, um, and how do you share that information, which you kind of alluded to um, earlier in our conversation. So I still see some of those things now with our clients of how do you share the information? Um, the forensics still takes, you know, a couple of days, if not weeks, to really determine what happened and what did they touch. Um, and so the more technology that we're implementing, I think the bigger those challenges are going to be. Um, so I think that that would be the, the war story I would share for this audience. Great. CJ, same opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. So I think probably a good example going back to the old days, uh, Sean, would be uh, a case that uh, caught some notoriety called Moonlight Maze. Um, it was an investigation into intrusions into uh, Department of Defense, um, as well as Department of Energy and other, other sites uh, around the world. Um, I think it's a great example of um, the what today we would call APTs or advanced persistent threats wasn't called that back then. Now we have all kinds of uh, names for such things and numbers and things. But back then, this I think would be a canonical example of one of our first or early APTs. And I think the second part coming out of that, and probably one of the biggest lessons learned is it was within the uh, uh, government sector, we were able to pull together 42 different agencies to form a collaborative working cell in order to be able to work together against this common threat that we were all facing. Um, subsequently, that bled into private sector and use it in working with private sector from that standpoint. And that's the type of uh, interaction that we need to see today, not only in government, but also the private sector entities collaborating, working together against the common threats in order to keep these things from, from moving uh, through, through all of our businesses. So sharing of information, sharing of the means by which to, um, to, to thwart this uh, common adversaries. I'm so glad to see both of your examples focusing on collaboration because actually my wrap up point was going to be specifically on collaboration in all of the IRs and I've been involved in hundreds of them over the last 20 years. The most successful ones were, were where people were collaborating both internally and externally within the different business units in the private sector and then externally with uh, uh, independent counsel or private counsel, outside counsel, working with other vendors, working with uh, the, the the public sector, if appropriate, and certainly my time in, in the government, uh, working with the intel community, other law enforcement agencies, state and local and federal, were the most successful investigations because everybody brings something of value to the table. Everybody brings an expertise. So I'm really glad you both finished there because that's where I'd like to finish. I want to thank you both. Um, you, you both are, are real uh, experts in this space, uh, very well recognized and respected. And I've always appreciated both your collaboration and uh, most importantly, your friendship. So thanks to both of you. And thanks to everybody for, for joining with us. If you've got questions, type them in. We're happy to respond to you um, at this moment. So thank you all. Thanks, guys. Bye. Thank See you. John. Bye.